coming up on my week. We are on the road at the Detroit Policy Conference. Nolan, who are you talking to? Detroit Police Chief James Craig. All right, Stephen? Mark Wallace of the Riverfront Conservancy about the changes along Detroit's water. All right, sounds good. We're going to be talking some civility and politics with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell and Congressman Fred Upton. Stay put. My week starts right now. Did you know Gordon Food Service was started by a 23-year-old entrepreneur as a butter and egg delivery business more than a century ago. In 1948, school teacher Gerard Wendell Hayworth borrowed $10,000 from his parents to start a woodworking operation in his family's garage. It's now Hayworth Incorporated. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding for this program is provided by Delta Airlines. Keep climbing. my week. I'm Kristen McDonald. We are on the road for this show. We're in Detroit at the Detroit Policy Conference. Nolan Finley from the Detroit News. Sandy Brewer, the CEO of the Detroit Regional Chamber. And of course, Stephen Henderson from WDET. Guys, I mean, when we can all just walk into a room together like this, I mean, come on. It's a way to start a show. I tell you, we only had to practice it 10 times. It was great. You know, I think I'm going to give you guys an A, an A for, for execution, maybe. A little I'm a B minus, though. The shot for, for looks effort. good. <laughs> no, it's good to see you. You know, Sandy, we're starting off the, the policy conference, and the entire theme for it is civility. And here we have probably guys that disagree the most, but are, I think, probably the most civil at doing it. What was the idea behind doing civility with the So conference? we had civility as a theme for our 2017 Mackinac Policy Conference, right. and it was the most talked about pillar at last year's event. More of our national speakers chose to speak on civility. It got more media uh, coverage than any other uh, pillar. And then Speaking of these two guys, right. we use these two, Stephen and Nolan, as a great example of civility because, you know, these two are, are you know, competing newspapers, competing philosophical views, but they're va fantastic friends, and I'm, I'm proud to call them my friends as well, too. But they are the walking embodiment of how people can be disagreeable without, I mean, without can disagree without being disagreeable. No, no, you're right. Sometimes we're disagreeable. Yeah, I mean, well, you're, you're, you're disagreeable <laughs> depending yeah, on the time of day. Did you ever, you ever see our show? <laughs> no, but I think it's interesting. Do you think that we are getting less civil, Stephen? Are we getting more civil? Uh, I mean, as a culture, we're getting less civil. There's no question about it. I mean, the, the last few years in particular, we've seen people on both sides of the aisle sort of heighten the rhetoric, uh, sort of retrench to their own spaces. And it's more and more difficult, I think, to even get people to sit down with somebody who, who disagrees. Uh, and, and that's unfortunate because the only way forward is really to be able to, to talk about these things. Uh, one of the things I think is really tragic is the the idea that somehow civ civilians become a dirty word, right? It, it means backing away from your principles. It or means, it means you've lost. It if means you've given any in. ground that you've lost. And I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I think uh, a civil assertion is really important, right? Civil, uh, civil uh, assertion of your principles and values and saying, look, this is what I believe, but I can still hear from you and But part of having that. that civility, though, Nolan, would be knowing kind of where that other person is coming from, and but we sometimes don't even take that time. No, we make a realize. lot of assumptions about how someone else forms their opinions and how they come to their conclusions and we usually assign negative connotations to that and Steve and I did a little exercise on NPR last summer where we really tried to talk to each other and get to the roots of how we come to be where we are today and it was an exercise I think I, I think people should uh, go through. Yeah, we went into a little trailer and we didn't yeah. club each other to death. Much. We both came no. out alright. So Sandy, what do you want people to kind of take away from today when we're talking about Detroit in the next kind of steps for the city and weaving in the civility of the entire conversation? So when you think of the word civility, the root word is civil. And what does it mean to be civil? That we all live together. We all live together in a community or a nation. And what is it to live in a civil society? We are all citizens. So in order to be citizens, in order to be in a civic society, 
Civility is not an option, it is a must. We have to be able to talk to each other. This is a nation of over 300 million people. The crunch of granola type in, in Vermont has the same opinion or the same value of their opinion as the cowboy in Oklahoma, and we have to learn to talk to each other. All right, well, we've got a full show coming up for you. Coming up, we're going to hear from Detroit Police Chief James Craig. No one's going to sit down and talk with him about school safety and also city safety. And also, Stephen's going to be talking to Mark Wallace. He's the CEO of the Riverfront Conservancy. But coming up right now, I had a conversation with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell and Congressman Fred Upton about civility in Washington, D.C. Take a look. All right, so at the Detroit Policy Conference, the entire theme is civility here. And I think the one place that everyone says there's no civility whatsoever is Washington, D.C. And I'm going to ask you, do you think you get a bad rap on that? Uh, it's accurate. It's true. There's a lot of dysfunction. Uh, Debbie and I are two of the folks on both sides, of, on either side of the aisle that say this stuff's got to end. We want to work together. Let's look at the issues that unite us. Uh, as the former chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I changed the rules of the committee so that bipartisan amendments go first. And the record of getting things done in a bipartisan basis was second to none. But Debbie and I are best of friends. We're working on a lot of issues together. Mm -hmm. Immigration, the budget, uh, and obviously the guns. topic of today, yes. guns and school safety. Debbie, how do you ratchet down the incivility? Well, I mean, you first have to develop relationships. You have to listen to each other. You have to respect each other. I spend a lot of time on the Republican side of the House. Actually, sometimes people think they can find me over there more than... I find you as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then Fred spends a lot of time on our side of the aisle. It's, it's being willing to talk to each other, to listen to each other. You, respecting each other's different point of views. You, we have, I think many people have the same values. We have different perspectives. Different perspectives are important. All right, well, it's, it's especially good to have different perspectives when you are working on the issues that you're working on. And specifically, I do want to talk about gun control and safety. You are both on this Problem Solvers Caucus, which is fairly young, right? Yeah, 48 about members, so half Republican, half Democrat. What are those meetings like, Fred, and, and how do you get to some kind of consensus with the issues that you're dealing with? Well, the one bylaw that we have is to move forward, we need 75% of our group to be on board. Mm -hmm. So we meet regularly and we talk about whatever it is, the, the topic of the day. So it was guns this week and school safety. We had a number of members that were there. It was an early breakfast and this week was truncated because we had the funeral of uh, Billy Graham who, who lay in state. So we, that's why I'm here today because we didn't have votes uh, today uh, where we were supposed to. But, you know, we talked about the issues that we care about. All of them, and we're Debbie and I now. Uh, we've sat down. We've put together a, an A to Z list of all the different issues, from banning assault weapons to having a, a button at the school that somebody can push and bring the law enforcement. Uh, Nick's fix, mental health, school hardening, lots of different issues. We're going to be sitting down with our task force that we've assembled the uh, first thing next week, Monday. And you're chairing this task force. We are yeah. the chairs. Uh, we've got some good people that are members of that group. We're going to go through and see where we all are, and if some of them, and I think that we can, get to 75, eight, even 100% uh, in support of these, and then we're going to push to get it done. Give me some specifics in terms of what exactly that you're looking at, because so many times we've had this conversation after mass shooting saying it's just too big of an issue for us to even get consensus on both sides. Where do you start in terms of saying, all right, we can get X, Y, and Z through when it comes to gun control? So I think, first of all, it's very important that you not go back to the regular corners that everybody goes to. And I think, look, I'm married to one of the strongest defenders of the, of the Second Amendment in this country, and we have regular, loud discussions about this since the beginning of my marriage. And he didn't change his locks from last night, right? That's right. I'm introducing a bill after I learned that he had done something, and I called Fred and said, I'm still married. But um, to, to go back to where that common uh, ground is, I think, and you heard President Trump yesterday, background checks. Uh, you know, some of the different proposals we're looking at is how do, right now, we have a background check bill and many of the states aren't putting data into the mix, the database that needs to go in there about whether somebody has a history of uh, mental uh, illness, if they've been convicted of felonies, that data needs to go in there. Do you look at raising the age of when someone can buy an automatic weapon? We, Fred and I both last week met with our local law enforcement, judges, prosecutors, educators, mental health, ACLU, students, teachers, parents, 
all of the stakeholders and said, what do you need? I think we both heard that law enforcement needs the ability that if they deem someone to be a threat to themselves, to be able to take that weapon away. Uh, so we're looking at what's known as red flag legislation as a potential. Seven states have it. Michigan is not one. Uh, I talked about it with Governor Snyder earlier this week. Uh, I'm told that in some of our major cities that have it, it's actually used uh, as much as you know one or two times a week. What's different this time, do you think? You know what? The kids are making a real difference. I, I think social media has been a, a, a big positive, but we're all just struck by this thing on Valentine's Day. You know, these kids, and you know, we've met with them, and I can remember meeting with the kids from Columbine. I was then on the Education Committee. It was just as tragic then, but you didn't have the media, you didn't have the, the uh, you know, I've got, we had, in my district, uh, Southwest Michigan this week, we had five schools that had threats. Uh, some of them actually closed because of the seriousness of it. So we've got to push forward, and I think this having a proper bipartisan approach to dealing with this issue, if we can stop it, we're all on board. And I, I welcome the, the discussion that's going on now, but we've got to move forward with something, and that's what we're about. So you get a little sense of what they're talking about in Washington about guns. Well, Nolan talked with Detroit Police Chief James Craig about school safety. Take a listen. Thanks for joining us on my week today. Glad You're here at the policy conference. You're going to be on stage later. You'll be talking about civility. That's the theme of the day. And you have a different, sort of a different take on civility. Uh, you think before we can get to, to civility, people have to start being civil on a lot of issues. Respectful, mm -hmm. balanced, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to get away from the knee-jerk reaction. Uh -huh. We take one small comment and we run with it and we lose out on what the true meaning is. We don't try to seek to understand. And you were hit with that this week when Absolutely. you suggested that you support arming some school teachers in schools. And right away, you were condemned, roundly condemned uh, for that position. Some condemned. Yes. And I always I put emphasis on some condemned. Okay. And without anyone trying to seek understanding, mm -hmm. we talk about former military. Mm -hmm former law enforcement who are now teachers mm -hmm. who can be in another layer of security. But that's just one part of the issue. We're not just talking about arming teachers and right. when they come in with their lesson plans at the beginning of the day, yeah. we hand them a, a firearm. That's senseless, it's ridiculous. And when people react to those things without trying to understand, yeah. because I understand I'm battling with soundbite. Right. And I understand it. But it was thoughtful. It wasn't something that was reactionary. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the only thing I talked about. The most important thing is how are we addressing the mentally ill? Right. How are we dealing with that issue? Because there's a, a, a nexus to all of these things. What are we doing about communication? Are we communicating? Uh, you know, that this whole saying, see something, say something. We see the failures in Florida. And then once we say something, how's law enforcement responding? Are we responding timely? And you also uh, called out uh, some of our political class for their selective outrage. You've lost a lot of officers and around the country. Absolutely. We've lost a lot of police officers to gun violence. It's not something you're insensitive to. I'm not insensitive, but, but let me just say this. I'm disappointed. Mm -hmm. Now, I will first of all acknowledge the governor of this great state, the attorney general, the mayor of the city of Detroit, certainly the city council president and city council members who, when we are faced with these tragedies, they've been up front in support. But then you get others that sit up in uh, U.S. representatives, uh, state reps, who have said absolutely nothing. But then when they see a statement that they perceive to be reckless, now all of a sudden it's an attack, and that is wrong. How about denouncing the violence directed towards police officers? We, very, we, we hear very little about that from those individuals. Right. But they're ready to lay down and protest when they think an officer used force unnecessarily. So, Chief, you've been very open in, in your support of people legally owning weapons of self-defense. Since uh, I've been here. So, I was on the cover of an NRA magazine in 2014, predates the president's right. tenure mm -hmm. and his candidacy. So, so but what do we do about illegal guns in this city? What's the answer to keeping guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them or who have them illegally? That's the answer. Mm -hmm. Why, instead of talking solely about gun control, right. can we talk about crime control? Mm -hmm. Keeping, as you point out, keeping guns out of the hands of criminals, keeping guns out of the hands of those suffering from mental illness. That's the real answer. The gun by itself is not a killing machine. It's who has possession. 
And so we really need to focus on that. We really need to drill down and find ways, better ways, especially when you talk about the mental illness. I think that's a big challenge yeah. for the country because we're not responding to the mentally ill, we're not addressing the mentally ill, and then when someone goes out and purchases a weapon, where are the flags at? We know the incident in Florida, that young man had in excess of, I'm told, either 40 or 80 contacts with the police. Would it have been easy for those contacts to be embedded in a, a, a database right. so when he went to purchase weapons, the flags come up? And that's what needs to happen. So, please, Chief, you're out here talking at a business conference with business people. Business people in this community have been instrumental in your crime fighting effort through the Green Light program. Absolutely. How is that program working, and what do you envision for it next? Well, it's beyond my wildest exp expectations. I will tell you that, you know, the businesses have lined up. They've become partners to not only law enforcement, mm -hmm. but they've been good neighbors. I mean, we have a green light uh, corridor in Greektown. Uh, we have strip malls that are signing up, all voluntary. We know we've seen a, a, a reduction in violence, both robberies, carjackings, because as I pointed out early in my tenure, that these were locations where crimes were happening. Turning now to development along the waterfront, Stephen spoke with Mark Wallace. He's the CEO of the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy about the plans there. So the theme today at the conference is civility, and I think you're sort of a perfect guest for that because when I think about civility and the way that we interact with each other in Metro Detroit, the riverfront is one of the things that really comes to mind. It is, it has become, I should say, a gathering place for people from all over the region, people of all hues and religions and whatever. Uh, we all now have this gem that we can enjoy together. That's right. Well, it's, it's really critical and, and a core part of the business we do as an organization. We want to be a place where everyone feels welcome in a place that is really that gathering spot for our entire community. And my idea for this conference is really simple, that we need spaces where we can come together. Because if we always agree, there's no need for civility. And when there's no disagreement, there's no need to exercise that, that, that practice. Uh, so sometimes those are cyberspaces, uh, Facebook and, and Twitter. You know, those kind of tend to drive us into our corners. Yeah. But, Places like the Riverwalk that have embraced everyone and embraced diversity really bring people together in a way where they can start to practice being around people who are different. And it's really important for us at this moment. So uh, catch us up on where we are with, I mean, the idea has always been bridge to bridge, right? That's right. Ambassador to Belle Isle, we're close, right? We are. We're, we're making great progress. So there will be a lot of construction this summer, uh, including the Unroyal Promenade connecting Mount Elliott Park to the Belle Isle Bridge. Yeah. That's a critical piece. Yeah. We're also doing a second to Quinter cut in partnership with the city. So that'll be up Joseph Campo, and that'll welcome a lot of neighbors who are currently cut off from the waterfront. And we're starting to pivot our focus over towards the West Riverfront, and West Riverfront Park's design competition, which just wrapped up, has been a really inspiring moment for us as a city. And you, you can go take a look at the models uh, now, That's right. and they are incredible. I mean, it is so far beyond what I ever would have imagined we'd do with the riverfront in Detroit. Just the, the, the number of things that are there, and again, the access that people will have, the public. To, That's the, right. to the waterfront. Well, it, it's critical, and one of the things we've learned is that a system is much more valuable than the sum of its individual right, parts. Right. So for us to have five and a half miles that connect, that pull the neighbors together, it's really important. And that park space is 22 acres, so it's almost the same size as Millennium Park in Chicago right. for wow. context. And it's really got the opportunity to change the world for everyone who lives in that neighborhood. Uh, southwest Corktown, Mexican Town, but also to be a regional attraction where people can come from the suburbs and experience the city with their kids for the first time. Yeah, uh, DeQuinder Cut, you talked about uh, the the new extension. You know, I, I look at that all the time and think of the High Line yeah. in Detroit, and we're starting to see, you know, just like in New York, where there was development that happened along that track because of the High Line, we're starting to see people yeah. say, hey, I'm gonna build something close to the cut. Well, it's really exciting. The old Joe Muro site, I think it's gonna be in play relatively yeah. soon. We're also starting to see a lot of industrial buildings that had loading docks that could load onto the trains. They're starting to think about those spaces as potential food and beverage options. So it's really an amazing catalyst, but it's also wonderful to see little kids learning how to ride their bikes on the Defender Cup for the first time. Because <laughs> right. Detroit is a big city. You know, not everybody's sidewalk is a great sidewalk. <laughs> 
and not everybody's street is a great street. So acknowledging that, we've created a place where everyone feels safe and everyone feels comfortable. Yeah. Uh, once we get bridge to bridge, then what? What are you going to do then? <laughs> well, then it's all about programming. I mean, obviously, the, the space is only as good as the people who show up. Um, and if we built a gravel parking lot, but it was full of millions of people, it'd be a successful parking lot. Uh, we tried to certainly build some of its... Uh, it's equivalent with the aspiration that we have as a community. Uh, but for us, it's about making sure that everyone continues to feel welcome. We're encouraging the economic development because that job base that's being created adjacent to the riverfront is also very important for Detroit in this moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything that could set us back? I mean, I think all the time about how far we've come along the riverfront about when I was a kid. It just wasn't a place you went at all, and I always, no, I'm a Detroiter. I'm sort of a cynic, right? Maybe this will all go away. Uh, are we past that point? Are we sort of past that tipping point where we, we have to worry? Yeah, I, I think for the Riverwalk in particular, no one is ever going to turn these parks back into back factories. Back to in the industry, it's, it's right? never going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and as an organization, we've sustained the city bankruptcy. We've sustained the bankruptcy of some of our early partners uh, in the project. And we've always kept it open. We've always kept it clean. So it's our goal of, of stewardship. And you can see the full version of all of our interviews at myweek.org. All right, guys, as we wrap up everything today from Detroit, you know what happened five years ago today in Detroit? No, I don't. Any guesses? Uh, bankruptcy. Governor Snyder oh. declared, a, uh, yeah, he declared a financial emergency, and I thought it was really interesting. That was five years ago today, and the three of us were there at that were announcement. That, we covered that announcement, yeah. and, and as we did kind of a live um, press conference uh, for that. everyone, and I find it so odd. It was five years ago, March, and see where we March are, March 1st, and where we, we are today with the city. Bit. No, you guys haven't changed, but the city Rare. has changed. But, but we look the same. You, yeah, look, right. you look younger. Don't roll the clip. You look younger. No, but, but I think that there's something symbolic about that when we're here at a policy conference talking about kind of where Detroit is headed yeah. and where we have been in the last five years, Nolan. Oh, no, I mean, it's been incredible. If you look at where, where we've come at that time, our conversation was all about the damage that was going to be done because of the bankruptcy. Right. We speculated, and others, that Detroit would be stripped bare of everything that mattered, that it would be placed in this hole it could never dig out of. And instead, bankruptcy became this rejuvenator, yeah. this enabler of a what has been a real surge yeah. over the last five years, and putting the city back on it's financial footing. We're just now coming out of state oversight. I don't think anyone dreamed it would be that quick. And the growth as well that we're seeing. Yeah, no, I mean, it, what it did was stabilize city government so that it could deliver services and not be looking over its shoulder all the time at creditors who were not being paid. It accomplished that. You know, bankruptcy is still a little controversial in some circles because people think it was... Yeah. Uh, takeover of the city and all these the things. Manager, yeah. But if you look at the results, the question I always ask is, what else would you have done to get us into that shape? What else would you have done to renegotiate 13, 15 billion dollars worth of debt? What else would you have done to make sure that trash and police and fire work somewhat efficiently uh, the way they do now? We didn't have much of a choice. And so look, we can always look now and see what the next five years is going to hold in terms of really keeping an eye on population growth. And if hopefully we we'll be standing right city. here, yeah. the three of us. Five standing years right. Five years, March 1st, uh, 2022? Yeah. That's right. Oh, that's we'll right. be here. I'll hold you to it. It's a day. All right. <laughs> that's going to do it for my week. Thanks so much for joining us. For Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson and everyone at Detroit Public TV, and also thanks to the Detroit Regional Chamber for having us here at the Policy Conference. We're going to catch you next week for my week. Take care.